it's 45 minutes is the presentation time. Just I will okay. uh, give you information. Thanks a lot, dear Linda Yu. Initially, I would like to say thanks uh, for joining International Symposium on Economic Thoughts as our keynote speaker. Uh, I think the topic that you will give speech is the great economies and how their ideas can help uh, uh, us today. And uh, dear Li uh, Linda, you had the floor is yours. Thanks a lot again for participation uh, event. Thank you very much. Um, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to join you um, at this virtual symposium and give this keynote on um, the great economists, their lives, ideas, and how they can help us today. So this is drawn from my uh, latest book and you can find, um, I think uh, if I gave a sense of the book, I think you'll find um, it really is about their lives, ideas, <laughs> and then applying um, their thoughts to um, our biggest economic um, challenges today. So I'm going to um, essentially start um, with a, an overview perhaps of how their ideas um, had begun to um, have already, I should say, um, changed quite a lot um, of our world. So I'm gonna start with ideas that have changed the world um, and then I'll move into some of the uh, the specifics um, of each of the uh, great economists. In 45 minutes, I won't be able to uh, cover um, <laughs> all of them, um, but um, I very much look forward to uh, our Q&A and, um, and discussing um, further. So I'm starting off with the ideas that have changed the world. Now, there's quite a lot to choose from. So I've essentially um, highlighted really um, three that I, um, which is a strand um, that goes through um, my book, which covers about 250 years of um, economic history and economic thought. So I start with um, a idea that really has reshaped uh, globalization, uh, the interconnectedness of the world in which we live. So the end of protectionism in the mid 19th century, and I date this to the repeal um, of the Corn Laws um, in 1846. So we cast our minds back to um, essentially the predominant economic idea um, before the mid 19th century. Um, that was around mercantilism. So countries believe that having a trade surplus um, is what um, trade policy and indeed the economic system um, was geared at. So what happened um, was really with um, Adam Smith, um, who's the great economist that I start with um, in my book, um, and thinking about the ways, the premises of international trade, he advocated absolute advantage. Um, he linked the competitiveness of the economy to um, its position um, in global markets. And his disciple of sorts, I say of sorts because um, David Ricardo, uh, known as the father of international trade, uh, never actually met Adam Smith, but he's a disciple in the sense of um, taking those ideas and, um, and becoming a classical um, economist. And of course, his theory of comparative advantage um, that um, he began to use and others indeed who had been arguing for some time um, should really be ending this um, dominant uh, paradigm of uh, mercantilism and moving uh, to a, a more open, commercially driven um, economy and global, um, global markets. Um, and this began to, um, I think, not just shift economic thinking, but began to shift um, politically as well. So David Ricardo um, ended up in parliament and he and um, others, um, and this ultimately um, was repealed. Uh, the Corn Laws were repealed after the death of David Ricardo. So he never saw the fruits of, of, um, of his, um, uh, his thoughts. Um, but the, uh, the momentum it created meant that um, the Corn Laws, which were a tariff on imported grains um, of 
you know, which protected landowners. Um, that was the, uh, you know, that was the protectionist piece of legislation that um, Sir Robert Peel, um, who was prime minister um, of England, um, his mind was changed and he was persuaded uh, to repeal the corn laws by the shift in thinking. And that meant that after the mid 19th century, um, England began to focus um, not on mercantilism, um, but um, began to um, really have a commercial period um, of trade uh, based on comparative advantage. And um, the late 19th century um, was a period um, where you began to see uh, much greater uh, globalization, much greater trading. So that idea, um, change the, the way in which we interact with the global economy today. Now, of course, um, this idea of mercantilism being the preferred um, system does come back. And so clearly um, ideas don't go away. They just have periods of ebbs and flows. Um, but the second um, idea um, that changed the world in which we live um, actually follows from um, the first uh, change that I just outlined. So the emergence of the welfare state, um, really, I think, um, after World War II, um, that you can trace um, to the, uh, the first um, uh, period that I described of um, significant economic change. So the, you know, the economic consensus, which is another way of thinking about how um, the end of protectionism changed the system. It changed the economic consensus from one which was more mercant mercantilist to one that was based on comparative advantage. But that economic consensus, um, more broadly speaking, beyond trade, began to break down um, in the latter part of the 19th century. So what we saw was there was a, a panic um, of 1876 in the United States, a, a railroad um, speculative bubble burst, and that financial crisis spread across the Atlantic and affected um, England, it affected um, Europe. And that, um, on top of the fact the late 19th century, um, was also the period of the Gilded Age. And that was a term used by novelists like F. Scott Fitzgerald um, for to describe the level of income inequality in the United States um, in that time. So the financial crisis um, plus high levels of inequality and uh, a number of recessions um, in the latter part of the 19th century um, led to actually unemployment um, appearing in the dictionary for the first time. And that began to, the economic consensus um, that was and that was seemingly there from the time of Adam Smith, the Industrial Revolution, um, ending protectionism. Um, that consensus began to break down in the late 19th century. So that was also the rise of um, the period of the rise of Marxism, Karl Marx, um, a German economist who saw exactly the same Industrial Revolution as the classical economists um, like David Ricardo. Um, but um, he drew a different conclusion. Um, he thought that inevitably um, inequality and um, uh, you know, the globalization's losers, um, the spread of crises, that that would push uh, towards communism. So what we saw was the economic consensus breaking down and a battle of ideas um, emerging in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And with the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 um, in Russia, um, began to see the spread of communism. And it wasn't just communism, it was also socialism. So by the early part of the 20th century, an estimated 40 to 60% um, of the world's populations lived in communist or socialist type regimes around the world. So that really led to a battle of ideas over how capitalism um, um, needed to change, uh, to adapt, uh, to provide um, a welfare state. And that's not a straightforward um, path. 
So what I'm describing in terms of the rethinking of the economic consensus, the economic system, um, which started um, really um, in the late 19th century, sort of bef and what I described on, on perhaps the, the other side of the battle of ideas, there was a parallel development happening within classical economics. So um, the Cambridge economist, Alfred Marshall, um, he, I tell his story um, in the book and he was initially quite resistant to the idea of welfare uh, transfers because he thought it would disincentivize work. However, he was concerned about um, the emergence of unemployment, of poverty. And so what um, his thinking um, during this period, um, and this again in England was the late Victorian period. And so there was a lot of focus on the deserving poor at the time. And this was also the period of the rise of philanthropists. Um, you know, so one example is uh, Baroness um, Angela Burdett Coutts, uh, who worked with uh, a Coutts client, Charles Dickens, the novelist, uh, who was highlighting the plight of the poor. And the, she was working with him to do charitable uh, support uh, for, uh, for poor communities. So within that social milieu, um, Alfred Marshall looked at the evidence that it seemed that, for instance, um, supporting uh, pensions wasn't having a disincentivizing effect on work. And then that began to, uh, I would say, uh, form um, that side of the battle of ideas where capitalism can include a welfare state and still, um, you know, and still deliver uh, the market-oriented um, benefits that had been seen throughout um, the Industrial Revolution. So um, it really took though until the end of World War II. Um, and of course, in this period, there was the New Deal in the, um, uh, in the UK, uh, the creation of the National Health Service. So that transformed the capitalist system into what we have today, which is welfare state capitalism. Um, in many advanced economies. And then that began to sway the battle of ideas between those who preferred a communist system and those who um, wanted to stick with a reformed um, capitalist system. So this battle though, probably wouldn't uh, be considered to have been concluded um, until the fall of communism um, in the late 1980s um, and going into the early uh, 1990s. So for instance, um, the, the, even as um, the consensus was beginning to shift, um, the USSR and the United States um, were not the only countries um, with these um, different systems. China uh, became communist after the communist revolution in 1949. So big swathes of the world um, were um, still, as I say, in this, um, in this um, battle of ideas. Um, but as we know, with the fall of the Berlin Wall um, and the breakup of the Soviet Union, um, it seemed uh, by the end of the 1980s, we had a new economic consensus, which was around uh, market-oriented economies. Um, so having, um, uh, in a sense, won the battle of ideas, um, the idea that uh, a welfare state capitalist system delivered more uh, for uh, countries and its people um, than the alternative, that idea seemed to create this new consensus um, by then. But if we fast forward, um, this consensus that um, started to itself break down um, by the uh, 1990s, so the 1980s was also uh, characterized by uh, Big Bang in the UK, uh, the Reagan Revolution, quite a lot of free market economists um, uh, began to hold sway during this period. Um, it was also the period of hyper-globalization. Um, so in the early 1990s, um, China began to open up significantly. India turned outward after a period of import substitution um, and the fall of the Berlin Wall meant a reintegration of Central and Eastern uh, Europe um, and others into the global system. Um, and with globalization or hyper-globalization as that period has been described, 
um, we saw protests against uh, globalization creating losers. For instance, at the 1999 WTO World Trade Organization meeting, um, we began to see an increase in inequality um, that by the early part of the 21st century had gotten so significant in the United States, um, it's been dubbed the second Gilded Age. So we are now again in a period where um, there is a backlash against globalization, where um, the breakdown in economic consensus means there is a search for alternatives and, um, and questioning uh, this economic system. So with that, I want to, um, to look at um, some of the uh, more granular details of some of these ideas, but I hope this, this sweep um, of um, brief sweep of economic history um, gives a sense of uh, some of the ideas um, that have been influential. And I think importantly for me to stress that um, this breakdown of economic consensus um, you know, historians and all of you will know well, um, is a recurring theme. And in this period, we are again experiencing uh, this breakdown um, in consensus. So this is, an, this is a time where new ideas could change uh, the world once again. Um, and certainly throughout history, we've seen um, that it can take some time, uh, but the ideas, uh, the economic ideas, the, the economic thought, um, that came before us um, have transformed um, the world in which we live. And um, we can learn lessons um, from those ideas that could help us with our biggest challenges um, today. Um, but before I go into some of those ideas, I might just um, uh, repeat a quote from Mark Twain, the American writer who said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So there won't be uh, exact parallels from history, um, but there could be useful tidbits um, that can, we can take um, away from the ideas of the great economists. So moving on to the great economists, um, one cannot cover every uh, great economist um, in one uh, book. Um, I focused um, on economists of an earlier vintage. So um, all of the um, great economists um, in my book um, except um, for Robert Solow, um, uh, you know, are no longer with us. And the great economists that I selected are the ones that um, created or contributed significantly to the seminal models um, in different areas of economics that fit within this larger um, uh, macro growth development uh, theme uh, that I focus on um, in the book, which is about economic systems. Um, it's not, uh, I don't cover micro um, very much. It's much more about the macro sweep um, of economic history. So in a very rough dichotomy, you can see there, this is obviously a very imperfect mapping of um, the extent of state involvement and the extent of, um, of free markets. Um, I have mapped there, um, um, Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, um, and the, they are um, less to the sort of the, uh, the end of the, the market spectrum um, than uh, economists like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman, a very well-known libertarian um, in terms of his view on the markets. And then on the other end um, is Karl Marx, uh, who saw uh, communism as the um, as the outcome of the industrial revolutions, the communist revolution. Um, John Maynard Keynes, um, I placed in between and the Keynesian revolution of the 1930s um, introduced, um, of course, a role for state intervention um, in um, influencing the economy in the short run. Um, and so um, as a rough placement, I, I placed um, him there. Now you might notice that um, I've color coded these, so they're sort of roughly um, uh, in, a, in a very similar stream of, of um, economic thought. But so, therefore, Joan Robinson, who was a disciple of John Maynard Keynes, um, she um, is farther to uh, the state end of the spectrum uh, than Keynes himself, because um, although she was uh, one of the five people entrusted to review his seminal work, The General Theory. Um, later on in her life, um, she um, began to embrace communism and she would wear 
uh, Vietnamese peasant um, um, outfits to give her lectures at Cambridge University. So she started off uh, closer to Kings and then later in her life, she began to move um, as it were across um, closer to, uh, to Karl Marx. So in terms of, I'm gonna, again, just focus very briefly on some of the, um, the thinking um, um, of the great economists. Um, and of course, this, in, you know, this will only be picking up um, uh, you know, very high level uh, summaries of, of where I think um, some of their ideas can contribute um, to our um, challenges today. And that's sort of the theme that I'll weave in. Um, and I won't, um, and um, I won't have time to go into it um, in detail, but hopefully that'll just give a sense um, as to how um, economic thought from previous periods in history can still help um, us think about our issues today. So Adam Smith, known as the father um, of economics, and um, you can draw a line from his work to uh, the classical economists, uh, Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, introduced the concept of the invisible hand um, within markets. So the ideas of Adam Smith I've used um, in that chapter to help think about um, whether or not government should rebalance the economy. So the revival of industrial policy, industrial strategies, um, that current move in a lot of um, uh, government policy today um, is about rebalancing towards making things again and feeling that, um, especially financial services, but um, having a large services sector for advanced economies may not generate um, uh, the kind of uh, growth that's sustainable for emerging economies. That debate is around um, whether or not being um, uh, services uh, based um, or in Danny Roderick's um, um, description, uh, premature deindustrialization, moving into services before having uh, fully industrialized, whether that's sufficient to, uh, to boost growth. So this chapter thinks about the ways in which Adam Smith had um, areas in which government could efficiently and effectively intervene and using those ideas to help inform uh, that challenge uh, that's with us today. The second great economist I focus on is David Ricardo. So known as the father of international trade, he came up with uh, the theory of comparative advantage. Um, he was a self-taught economist. Um, he became interested in economics um, um, after he made a great deal of money as a stockbroker in the city of London, um, he was on holiday um, and happened to pick up a copy of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations and taught himself economics. And he didn't just write the theory of comparative advantage. He also coined the term rent seeking, uh, which is um, also um, a very widely used concept in a number of other um, concepts as well. So David Ricardo's um, uh, chapter, um, I take his um, ideas around comparative advantage um, and clearly the very um, important um, component of domestic competitiveness and efficiency in that chapter. And I use it to think about whether or not trade deficits matter. So, you know, clearly for um, a lot of, um, uh, it's different for advanced economies as it is for emerging economies. Um, you know, but the domestic component, um, taking advanced economies and thinking about the ways in which a trade deficit is a reflection of a broader domestic piece. Um, I use that thinking of David Ricardo and the, um, the evidence of, of uh, trade deficits mattering and not mattering for um, a lot of countries uh, to use that to help that, uh, to use those economic um, ideas to think about um, uh, uh, you know, uh, this focus on trade surpluses, which we're uh, beginning to see um, around the world as well, a sort of, you know, a sort of a re-examination of um, a mercantilism, I guess, is one way to think about um, this breakdown in consensus um, and this focus on trade deficits and trade surpluses. So that's where the application of that economic um, idea um, is found. Um, Karl Marx is the next great economist that I focus on, uh, his Communist man, um, Manifesto, um, which was co-authored with um, Engels, Friedrich Engels, who must be the 
least credited co-author. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's clearly associated with Marx. So his, um, you know, his thinking around capitalism resulting in crisis, revolution, and then communism. In his um, thinking, the trigger for this revolution, he originally thought would be the panic of 1873. He later on thought the trigger would be um, inequality. Um, having seen um, the Gilded Age and having seen the rise of um, uh, inequality and poverty in the latter part of the 19th century. So in that chapter, um, I take a look at whether or not China, which is a um, politically communist um, transition economy from a command system of central planning um, and having now moved into um, market-oriented growth. Um, I use his um, uh, thinking, his thought, um, which was very early on um, in the Chinese um, system um, and, and analyze whether or not um, that mixed system that China has means that China can grow uh, prosperous. Um, and it's that the application of this was not just for China, it's also for other transition economies, for instance, um, Vietnam, um, which underwent uh, Doi Moi in 86, which is another um, introduction of market oriented reforms, much like China's in 1979. Um, the next um, great economist that I focus on is Alfred Marshall, who I've already uh, introduced um, earlier, uh, known as the father of neoclassical economics, the Cambridge School of Economics. Um, and I've described um, his contribution during the late Victorian period when the economic consensus broke down and there was a re-examining of whether or not you should have a welfare state. Um, so I won't repeat uh, what I said um, there before. Um, uh, Irving Fisher is the next great economist that I look at in terms of um, his life and his ideas. Um, he's credited as being the first really um, American great economist. Uh, he shifted the headquarters of economics to the United States um, and um, the American neoclassical um, economic school can probably be dated um, to him. His contributions are numerous. Uh, debt deflation theory is the one I focus on in that chapter. And um, that chapter asks whether or not um, we could be facing a repeat of the 1930s, um, where if we look around at um, very high rates of, um, uh, you know, even um, during, um, even though there has been deleveraging, the amount of debt um, in a lot of economies um, begins to raise questions about um, uh, deflation, deleveraging, and the various um, uh, aftermath of crises. And that's what the Irving uh, Fisher um, ideas uh, can really help us um, think that through. Now, I, I want to uh, just pause for a moment and, and say a word about Irving Fisher that, um, of course, um, economists know who Irving Fisher is, but um, um, most lay people probably wouldn't have heard of him before. And um, his inclusion might be a surprise um, to non-economists. And I think um, the reason for it um, is, of course, that um, in 1929, um, he predicted the stock market uh, was on a permanently high plateau. Um, and then after the great crash of 1929, um, you know, his reputation was in shatters, uh, was shattered. And, um, and actually so was his fortune um, because he um, then continually uh, predicted in the 1930s that um, the economy would uh, get right back uh, to where it was. So he ended up, um, he indebted his whole life, um, actually largely to his uh, sister-in-law. Um, and, um, and he's normally not included in, uh, in um, in, uh, you know, when people think of great economists, his name doesn't uh, really come up, even though uh, he was the, um, he was one of the, um, those who introduced uh, mathematics um, uh, into economics and uh, shifted uh, the gravity of, um, of economics uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, Britain um, to, uh, to the United States. Uh, the next great economist, uh, John Maynard Keynes, is very, is very well known. His ideas are themselves also very well known. And I've described um, uh, 
the, the 1930s, a bit earlier on, and the state intervention um, in the economy. And in that chapter, um, I ask whether or not um, government should invest. So this is a, um, a, a very big debate, um, especially now, as we look at the economic damage from the pandemic. Um, should governments invest when interest rates are this low um, with the uh, high level um, of debt um, as the backdrop? So Keynes's ideas, um, particularly around how uh, investment um, is needed um, because the, um, it's unlikely uh, that investment is, um, is sufficient without government intervention is the, is the idea that I focus on um, in this chapter to help us think through um, whether or not government should um, invest um, today. The next uh, great economist is Joseph Schumpeter. Um, the Austrian School of Economics. Um, his theories um, around uh, creative destruction um, uh, is uh, still um, one of the dominant uh, ways to think about uh, what drives innovation, which is the focus of that chapter. Uh, we seem to be living in an era, and I'll quote uh, the great economist Robert Solow that I um, will speak to in a few moments, um, that you can see the computer age everywhere, except in the productivity data. So I tackle the productivity question in that chapter, but in this chapter, I look at the ideas of Joseph Schumpeter around uh, creative destruction and what drives innovation and the parallel to today is he was writing during a period of the massive American trusts, companies like US Steel. Um, but at the same time, as he was doing his empirical research, he found there were you know, hundreds of startups in these sectors that were also competing. So as we look at um, today, where you seem to have um, a large number of startups, but you also have very dominant uh, tech uh, companies in particular, are there lessons that we can draw from Joseph Schumpeter's um, ideas and uh, analysis to help us think about uh, what drives innovation today and what's needed um, to um, uh, you know, to ensure um, that um, you know you do have a, a system that's innovative and not, um, or not, and that um, I think is um, is where some of the um, links to growth also obviously come in. So, um, but I, I put on here his um, his book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, because Joseph Schumpeter was also an active part of the debate um, during that. A battle of ideas period. Um, and his warning in that book is that capitalism um, is an engine and if it's not tended to, um, it can stall or even break down. So this idea of reforming uh, capitalism, um, it was, uh, is important um, and was during his time um, since that capitalist engine um, wouldn't just run without maintenance or indeed reform. So he was also part of um, some of the um, that battle of ideas, that debate um, in that at that time. Friedrich Hayek um, is the next great economist that um, I focus on, um, also the um, Austrian School of Economics, um, and uh, he moved to the Lenin School of Economics. Um, and I want to uh, focus on his rivalry with Keynes um, in a few moments. Um, his best known book, The Road to Serfdom, um, was also um, part of that battle of ideas against the rise of communism um, that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, his um, economic um, thought um, is, was a backdrop, uh, he was a proponent indeed of the free market, so the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions of the 1980s, and his ideas were very influential behind the Iron Curtain. Um, so in this book, um, I focus on um, there's a lot of things we could learn from, um, from Hayek um, in this area. Um, and I think the, um, the influence um, that he had in, in um, really arguing for, um, a com you know, arguing against uh, communist uh, regimes and towards and promoting um, capitalist ideas. He's more free market um, than a number of the um, economists that I've mentioned um, already. Um, but I think 
you know, whether or not we can learn uh, from financial crises, which are an endemic part um, of capitalist um, systems. And certainly during the period in which he was writing, there were numerous uh, financial crises. You know, there is something I think to be said for thinking about um, how his ideas around um, can be uh, uh, considered uh, to learn uh, from, um, even though, as I say, all of these thinkers are, are on a very spectrum um, and apply those uh, to some of the uh, concerns that we have about recurring crises as well. Uh, the next great economist, Joan Robinson, um, I described um, that she was a disciple of Keynes earlier on. Um, she was a pioneer of imperfect competition, monopsony, and her, her ideas of disguised and hidden unemployment, um, as well as the concept of monopsony, um, has been uh, revived uh, recently. We saw that um, in a recent Jackson Hole meeting um, in trying to understand why wages are so low. And that is the uh, title of the chapter um, where I look at her work um, in the um, 1930s and the development um, of a monopsy model to try and understand why it is that we have stagnant real wages today in a number of advanced economies. And for instance, in the United States, it's been stagnant for about 40 years and in parts of Europe, um, about 20 years. And so that's her economic thought um, is very uh, relevant uh, to us today. Uh, Milton Friedman, a uh, monetarist, libertarian um, with Anna Jacobs and Shorts and wrote the monetary, a monetary history of the United States. The Great Contraction um, in Money Supply explains the Great Depression. Um, and this chapter um, using um, Milton Friedman's, um, uh, who is, is you know, member of my original spectrum in terms of his economic thought, um, you know, are central banks doing too much with all the actions they're taking at the moment, QE, um, as, as well as uh, keeping uh, interest rates very low. So it looks at uh, the challenges of monetary policy um, and unwinding um, some of the support um, in that chapter. Uh, the next great economist who's thought I look at is Douglas uh, North, um, uh, the School of New Institutional Economics. Um, he looks at why nations fail and he um, and his co-authors uh, from political science and other subjects looked at why institutions and how to reincorporate institutions into mainstream um, economic uh, models. So this chapter looks at the question, um, you know, why are so few countries rich? So, you know, uh, a couple of statistics, I think, tell that story. Um, about a quarter of the world's countries are high income. Um, and the World Bank estimated there were 101 middle income countries in 1960. And by 2008, um, just 13 of those had joined the ranks of rich countries. So this chapter focuses on uh, one of our, our big challenges today, which is, um, you know, why aren't more countries coming out of the middle income strata, overcoming the middle income country trap and joining the ranks of, of rich countries? And his ideas help us um, guide us in that way. Uh, Robert Solow, um, the last great economist that I focus on, very well known, um, and I quoted last, actually the Solow last paradox. Five minutes, sorry for disturbing. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, the Solow paradox, um, which I quoted earlier. So this um, this chapter, using his uh, his um, uh, work, uh, looks at um, are we uh, are we doomed to a slow growth future? Do we face a slow growth future? And one insight um, that I'm just gonna highlight and pull out in the interest of time is just in the late 1990s, uh, Solo's work um, found that productivity did increase um, in that period. And it had to do with the um, adoption, the adaptation, the use of technological innovations um, by companies. Um, and that period has lessons, I think, uh, for uh, for us as we look at um, all the innovations which are surrounding us. And um, while we don't, uh, while we still see slow productivity um, growth um, and um, 
I'm going to finish with some thoughts on uh, the rivalries um, and then just uh, just wrapping up. Um, so Keynes versus Hayek. Um, the uh, this is a very well known rivalry. I just wanted to um, put in a couple of um, uh, you know pretty uh, widely watched videos <laughs> about um, their arguments um, over the Great uh, Depression. Um, so that first video, or it's like Hamilton, a couple of rappers um, play Keynes and Hayek, and they um, and they rap. Um, their arguments um, and their disagreements um, over the causes of the Great uh, Depression. Um, and then it was so popular, they did it again over the causes of the Great Recession. Uh, so I don't have time to go into uh, this rivalry, but um, I thought I would just um, uh, highlight it because obviously I, I don't have time to go into how they all knew each other and interacted, but certainly um, uh, this captures <laughs> one of the great rivalries. So just to finish up, um, the um, the next slides I'm just going to uh, to go right through because I've already um, incorporated those earlier when I was discussing um, our economic challenges and the economic ideas that could help us think us through. And these are just charts that just map out um, the extent um, of those challenges. Um, so as I uh, just pass through those um, and just finish, I think, with, um, you know, a couple of um, thoughts about where we currently are um, at. So one um, idea that I finished the book with is this globalization in trouble. And I think the ideas um, of, uh, well, of all the great economists can actually help um, us think about using um, how we set policies um, to begin to rebuild that consensus around globalization. Uh, the quote that I put here is by Paul Samuelson, um, another great economist uh, who was asked, I think, about why it is if um, trade creates losers um, that uh, more hasn't been done to help them. And uh, Samuelson's answer was, um, who was an advisor to JFK and other presidents, he said, I can't think of a president who has been overburdened by knowledge of economics. Um, and then another um, quote I like to always include when um, in this in this uh, presentation about trying to solve economic problems, which I think is um, always good to bear in mind, and I know that um, I'm sure we all do, is uh, never claim more than you can justify. Um, so you know, um, there are obviously a quite a lot to learn and know. Uh, and no easy answers uh, to a lot of these um, challenges, both in history and the mistakes that were made um, and the rivalries, which really show the difference in, in uh, approaches um, and, um, um, and how uh, you know, we can address these uh, challenges. It's not going to uh, be easy and it won't all be drawn from history. And uh, this is a, um, a quote by Joan Robinson that I often like to, um, uh, throw in, in for anyone who thinks um, about uh, the purpose of studying economics, as she says, is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to be, avoid being deceived um, by the economists. Um, and, uh, and with that, um, I think I am um, out of time. So I will uh, stop um, here and I'll stop sharing my slides and I look forward to um, um, our discussion. So thank you. Thanks very much. a lot, Linda, you for your great speech, and we are happy uh, to have you in this uh, seminar. Uh, let me see the the committee member whether we are. I think we are not going to take any questions, but let me to get response from uh, organizer. Sema, are you online? Yes, there is no question. Thank you. Okay. Professor. Okay, just I want to confirm before uh, ending uh, this session. Thanks a lot, Linda, you for your great speech. Uh, hope to hopefully uh, after COVID, we'd like to see you in the face-to-face okay, okay. uh, -face events <laughs> rather than online. Thanks a lot for participating uh, this event. Also, thanks a lot, Sema, for organizing. Uh, conference and okay thank you very much 
Okay. Thank you very much. I would look forward to the next symposium, perhaps even in person. Real pleasure. Thank you. Yes, yes. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.